pleasure that I introduce you to Dr. Croce. Um, uh, unlike myself, I, I work primarily on the preventive aspects. Uh, Dr. Crow uh, has a lot more experience than I do with doing actual treatment in the operating room. And so I thought it was a great opportunity to have her talk to you as well today. So um, please. Dr. Crow, as Clive said, and we're talking about the oral health treatments of patients in this population with FOP. So everyone knows in this audience what FOP stands for, the fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva. And we know that the, at birth, the number one way to diagnose is the toes, and that is the giveaway for this particular patient population and it continues obviously with them through life. And then we have the skeletal there. It's actually in a museum in Pennsylvania from an FOP patient that shows a lot of the fusions of the bone. And so as many of you know that FOP is a very rare disease. It affects one in two million live births, which translates to approximately 854 cases worldwide. Of those cases, we've done anywhere from 44 to 46 of them at Thomas Jefferson University operating room. The dental issues for an FOP patient, we obviously want to try for prevention, which means routine cleanings, and um, or home oral health care is vitally important. We can also address restorations, fillings, broken teeth, the surgical removal of teeth that cannot be fixed or are impacted, such as the wisdom teeth. And um, sometimes we have to create space to allow for eating if their uh, jaws are actually fused shut. These patients um, that can't open their mouth or that have difficulty bending their neck, whether it be partially or completely, these are all factors that we have to consider when we're treating this particular FOP population. What happens if the teeth are not treated? And this is a question I get a lot from the FOP patients because of there's a fear and a stigma with the mouth and the fusing shut and not getting treated. Well, those um, problems that could be, and this is whether you're FOP or not, it, we could always have gum disease that could affect the entire body we could end up with cavities or caries, which is tooth decay, that could develop into an abscess if it's left untreated. And that can affect either the region or if left for long periods of time can actually affect the entire body. Calculus is a hard deposit on the teeth, which is also in the common term named tartar. And that can prevent food and water from passing through the teeth and then what would happen if the patient has to throw up. So these are all legitimate concerns. And each of these, if left untreated, can cause progressive amounts of pain over time. So what happens if an FOP patient has cavities? That depends on how much they can open their mouth. That's really important. And as to whether or not they can have radiographs. Radiographs are very important. Um, whether you have FOP or not as far as diagnosing cavities, especially between the teeth or inside the tooth that are not always visible to the naked eye. So radiographs, like I said, I cannot be stressed enough as long as they can open and we get good x-rays. Treatment plan needs to be made understanding the complexities involved with the FOP patient population. What are those complexities? As long as the cavities are accessible, and the patient can open wide enough, they can be treated successfully in the dental office with what we call infiltration in, in local anesthetic without complications. That's another myth in the FOP community where, oh, needles, they absolutely cannot have them. That's not necessarily the case. However, if the cavity is on the lower in the molar region and they need what we call block anesthesia, then that's completely contraindicated in the FOP population. And that's when we have to start looking at taking them to the OR, to the operating room. And the reason it's contraindicated is because we are trying to avoid a flare up or cause any ossifications by putting a needle through the muscle. 
what does going to the OR look like or mean? If the FOP patient cannot open their mouth or they have multiple caries or they need this type of anesthetic, the block anesthesia on the lower mandibular molars, then we need to go to the OR. If the cavities are left untreated, they can lead to what we discussed earlier as far as possible abscesses or infections that could possibly go into the entire body. At Thomas Jefferson University Hospital, we have an FOP team that was primarily put together by Dr. Fred Kaplan and Dr. Sri Grunwald, and that is where we treat the majority of these patients. Where is it? It's in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There's Dr. Grunwald, and many of you know Nick Myler with his lovely bride, and that's one of the OR um, assistants. And here's Jonathan Carmichael. The patients did give permission, by the way, for us to, to use these. And this is in the pre-op area where they're checking his lung capacity with the spirometer like they were talking about earlier on the panel this morning. Here he is, already intubated and ready for the OR. It looks worse than it is, but there's lots of, compli lots of different things you have to consider as far as getting them ready and their neck mobility, whether they have it or they don't, and things of that nature. Here's another one where they're starting the IV prior to the surgery with Dr. Grunwald, and I brought this slide to show you that sometimes when they're wheelchair bound, they prefer to drive themselves into the OR in their wheelchair. <laughs> it's a little sense of independence. <laughs> the FOP team consists of Dr. Fred Kaplan, Dr. Sri Grunwald, who's in charge of the anesthesia and very knowledgeable on this topic, Elaine Kilmartin, Dr. Kilmartin is with Jefferson and also affiliated with DuPont. And then there's the chief of, or the chairman of oral maxillofacial surgery at Jefferson in Philadelphia, who is Dr. Robert Desidju, and the vice chair, who is Daniel Taub. Both of them are medical doctors as well as dentists, and they're extremely well-versed, and they're the ones that we have um, do the wisdom teeth because they understand all the complications involved. And then myself, I'm the dentist who works at Jefferson as well as in private practice in New Jersey. The other information, once Dr. Grunwald will talk about the actual putting the patient to sleep and the things involved with that, it's actually a procedure called awake fiber optic intubation. And then once they're asleep, we get a lateral ceph, um, which is an x-ray, especially on our patients that are fused. It's an x-ray outside their head that the radiology department brings in a big machine. We get the right and left lateral ceph so that we can see what's going on, and it picks up any gross abnormalities. And then the cavities are, if they're on the cheek side, they're accessed, uh, accessed through the cheek side. However, when it gets a little tricky is when the cavities are on the roof of the mouth side or on the tongue side, because we, if they're fused shut, we have to go through the cheek side to get to that side. And these are some of the things that we have to consider. Yeah. And it can be difficult for many reasons. Also, the white material that we use, it has to be in a dry field because otherwise it's technique sensitive and it will not adhere to the tooth. So there's a lot of factors involved. Some general information about cavities, now that we're switching to that, because it's really important, like what Clive's going to talk about on the preventive side. Um, a lot of people have a stigma about dental, so I don't see them until they're 9 or 10 years old, then they have multiple cavities, and then we have to go to the OR. It's a lot easier to catch them at 3 or 4 years of age when they don't have the cavities, so we don't have to go. But it's really good to have the team in place should we have to go. So it's not definitely an option. The cavities have to live in an acidic environment. Acid is important for cavities to grow or it's the nidus for them to grow. So consuming water versus juice and soda, whether you're FOP or not, is a very good thing, but especially in the FOP community. And then the diet, oral hygiene, um, maintaining a healthy oral cavity is paramount for everyone, but especially for our FOP patients. Examples of highly acidic foods, I just put this in here because I get asked this a lot. So it's soda because the carbonation in the soda is called acid phosphatase. The other question I get asked a lot is, well, my child loves carbonation. What about the carbonated waters? That's actually better because the water neutralizes that 
acid phosphatase. So if they have to have the carbonation, you're far better off picking the carbonated water or the fruit flavored waters that are carbonated. None is obviously better, but if you can't get them on water, consuming some kind of liquid to keep them hydrated is obviously important. And then the juices such as the orange, the tomato, and even apple juice. A lot of people don't realize that apple juice can be acidic. And the Gatorade, tomato sauce and ketchup, highly acidic. Sugary foods and high carbohydrate in, uh, diets, when they release the sugars as they break down on the teeth, they release a lot of acids and that causes these cavities. So obviously prevention is the best option by having your regular dental checkups, maintaining a healthy diet and very good meticulous oral home care. This I put in for those of you that are on the West Coast. Dr. Clive Friedman and myself are well versed in FOP, but so is Dr. Alan Wong at Pacific School of Dentistry in San Francisco. And he has always said, having seen almost three decades of hospital dentistry cases, I've been trying to find ways to minimize the need for it. And the reason he says that, and I am in agreement with him, is oftentimes when my patients are going to the OR, it's all over Facebook. We need prayers or their families all over. That's whether you're FOP or not when you're going into surgery, there's a fear factor. You're worrying about going under general anesthesia, the effects of it, things like that. So that's why... Dr. Kaplan and Dr. Grunwald made the FOP team and put us all together so that it's a knowledgeable group of folks that are very well aware of the risk factors because with FOP, it's a unique community who has unique needs. And obviously our first and foremost concern is the patient's safety. So that's how we kind of came about. But um, Dr. Wong also believes in minimally evasive and carries risk reduction is important and he believes in the use of silver diamine fluoride. And what that is, I can't get it to turn. But what that is, is it's a black um, uh, material up that has this, the fluoride in it. And he puts it on the teeth. Te cavities do not ever go away. But as long as you don't feed them, they don't get bigger. As long as it's asymptomatic and they're small, you can use this on the cavities and it does what we call arrest them. But it takes multiple uses of, um, of the silver diamine fluoride and it can reminimize the decay. However, the negative side effect of that is that the decay stains dark. And so it's not aesthetic, especially if it's on the front teeth because it's almost black. But it is a good thing that does work. And last but not least, I get asked a lot about the baby teeth, which is also called primary teeth, and whether the, if the cavity's there, do we need to take them out? What if it's over-retained, meaning it's there and the other tooth is coming in, things like that. If they are like what we call shark teeth, then more than likely it's not going to come out, and Clive can address that even more. But then we help it come out, and we usually just do that with topical, and they're fine. Um, if, it, if it's small and it's getting ready to come out and it's not causing any pain, then we just watch it. But that depends on the age and what the x-ray shows. So... I often say, whether it's an FOP community or just everyone, that I joke and say our primary, our baby teeth are actually our practice teeth. They're the teeth that get us to get it right. In the FOP community, you don't want a lot of practice because you don't want to end up in the OR if you don't have to. However, if you do have to go, we know what to do and we can treat you and, and get you taken care of and in a safe manner. Here's Dr. Friedman. Thanks, Corey. <clears throat> so um, what I'd like to do is just give you a little bit of the objectives of what I want to get covered today. Um, I am going to talk about treatment implications. I also want you to leave here knowing what kind of questions you need to ask your dentist when you're going to them. And I'm going to talk about risk management from a perspective not only of caries but of the whole mouth. 
So for many of you, you think oral health is just teeth, gums, and bones, but it's a lot more than that. It's about how we function. It's about our smiling. It's about our swallowing. It's about our breathing. It's about how we talk. And oral health involves all of those aspects. And so when we um, look at oral health from a dental perspective, we need to take into consideration everything. So some people ask me, when's the first time an individual should be seen? And I say two weeks of age. Two weeks of age. Um, because what that gives me is an ability to identify um, nose breathing, breastfeeding. Uh, and then by six months of age, I can go through nutritional counseling and uh, dental development with respect to diet. So many of the dentists that you might see will look at you as if you're totally nuts. Um, and even the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry say one year of age is the first time, but I say two weeks. Um, the mouth is the gateway to the whole body, so we cannot separate the mouth from the rest of the body. When we are eating, everything that we do is related to the health of the overall body. So we cannot expect, if you've got an abscess in a mouth, if you've got an abscess in a tooth, and it's bleeding infection into your whole body, you are having an impact on your overall immune system and on your overall biome. So if your mouth is not healthy, how can your body be healthy? We cannot separate the mouth from the body. I cannot stress this enough. Oh, this is, this is interesting. So what I'm going to do, it's <laughs> the, the, <laughs> the, 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 how it's looked at it is interesting. So I'm looking at it from a perspective of risk assessment and risk assessment not only of developing cavities, but also of developing malocclusions, developing gum disease, developing the ability to breathe and to swallow. All of these things we need to take into consideration. I do use a classification of um, health based on the um, international classification of health rather than of disease, and I'd like to identify that in any individual that we are assessing, we need to assess them from a function of five domains. So the treatment that we're going to provide to any individual is going to be dependent upon assessing them from the perspective of these five domains as in the um, international classification of health. The first is body structure and function. So with FOP, you're going to have a look at the overall structure of the body and how that impacts what we're going to be doing for an individual. And you're all very well familiar with many of the issues related to the body structure, which is huge in FOP. We're looking at your activity. What's your ability to eat? Again, a huge piece, and it's going to be variable based on every individual's own experience and their own sense of how much ankylosis they have, how much they don't have, what kind of forces they can do. And so looking at treatment planning is going to be different for every single individual, and we need to individualize it from these five domains. Participation within community and within even the dental office. How are you able to participate? What are the uh, adjustments that one need to do to make when you're in the dental chair in the dental environment? So these are questions you can be asking of your dentist in terms of how are they taking these things into consideration in coming up with a treatment plan for you. They're personal, personal factors that, again, we cannot forget to take into consideration. Um, sensitivity, personal control is a huge issue. Independence is a huge issue. And, you know, I'm a pediatric dentist, so I'm seeing kids from really young all the way through to adolescence. And a lot of times, this changes. People have spoken about hormonal changes. How do those hormonal changes impact an individual's ability to want to be independent or not independent, and we need to take those things into consideration when coming up with treatment plans. And then, of course, you have environmental factors, and this is going to be different across the globe with respect to um, how different companies or how different cultures uh, adjust for the different environmental factors. Who is the expert in FOP? And it's clear to me, you guys. 
parents and people with FOP are the experts. Hands down, you are the experts. You know more about this disease than any professional that you're going to see other than perhaps Dr. Kaplan, sorry. <laughs> um, but you are the experts. And um, the dentist is only there to help facilitate care for you. So please regard yourself as the expert in the disease and don't hesitate to educate your professional. And if they're not prepared to be educated, sorry, change dentists. Change doctors. Any time, any time that we look at treatment, I think everybody, uh, Dr. Crow has spoken about this, is we need to have a look at the risk-benefit ratio of treatment. What is the risk versus the benefit and we need to take that into consideration with all those five domains in conjunction with you, the patient and the parent. Um, so um, is it worthwhile for these, these, um, these are uh, cape hunting dogs to cross that lake to get to that zebra? Uh, that's the kind of thing that you need to be thinking of when you're looking at risk benefit ratio. Is there an alligator in that pond? Is there an alligator that's going to come and bite you when you go and have kind of dental treatment done? I'm, I'm exaggerating, but I think I want you to get that sense. And I love Dr. Um, Kaplan's analogy. Anything that we do that's going to wake that sleeping bear, let's not do it. So we, um, anything that's going to encourage that force it to open even more, Let's not do it. So we need to be thinking about this. And you guys are the ones who really know. You guys are the ones who really know what are your triggers. I have no idea because everybody's different. And if you can identify what those are to us, the professional, we can take that into consideration in treatment planning. So anytime we do an oral health evaluation, we're looking at the airway, how are you sleeping? How are you breathing? Are you breathing through your nose, through your mouth? Are there impacts of how you're breathing? Uh, they spoke about the, the, the importance of breathing today, and I think we need to think about that when we're doing our oral evaluations. Um, we need to think about behaviors. Um, let us know when were the last flare-ups, what's the impact of flare-ups, what kind of drugs are you on? Um, have there been changes since the last appointment? Diet is a huge one. Uh, regurgitation in those individuals who are completely closed, who have got full dentitions, and if you're going to be vomiting, regurgitating, is that an issue? What are some of the impacts of the drugs you're on? Is that something that you need to take into consideration? So these are the things that we, and doing our oral evaluations, need to do. And then, of course, communication. Uh, speech is a huge piece. Um, tongue positioning and how tongue functions is a huge piece in what we do. So if we have a look at evaluating people, we're looking at posture, we're looking at um, the, um, that's backwards, but uh, <laughs> um, how, how, how are individuals functioning? Um, we're looking at the soft tissue exam, you're looking at the impact of, again, if you've got um, a garbage dump in your mouth, you can imagine what's going into your stomach. You can imagine what's going into the rest of your mouth. And when we talk about cleaning, keeping your teeth clean, it's not just to prevent cavities, folks. It is the beginning of the microbiome of our whole bodies. They're doing studies on gut bacteria. Where do those gut bacteria start? They start in the mouth. That's where they start. We need to be taking that into consideration. So when you do go to the dentist, hopefully, this is something you can ask your dentists to do. Make sure that you're not going to do it on a lion, but I want you to do uh, baseline openings. And every time you have an uh, individual, you want to um, evaluate the amount of opening they have since you go to the dentist once every three months, once every six months, the dentist is going to see you perhaps more often than the doctor, have a baseline opening of how wide you can open. Um, I'm, uh, is, um,
Yes, I'm measuring with a ruler. Yes, that's, that's a specific, very specific dental evaluation tool that you can get a very, very close um, 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 uh, effect on how much, in terms of micromillimeters, on how much the mouth is opening. So um, the, the other baseline in, thing that I think that I like to do is pulse oximetry. What's the oxygenation of uh, each individual that's coming in as a baseline that we keep in the chart. Um, Michelle's not here, I don't see her, but one of the things that I'm going to ask Michelle to have a look at from the IFOPA perspective is the creation of a, a um, FOP passport. An FOP passport where you as individuals will have a kind of passport which has your whole history, an app that will make it easy to collect, that you can take this with you to any professional that you go to, that you can then have all the information in one spot and the history of that information. And if you can collect it on an app, much, much easier. An app in the phone. It's not developed yet, but it's one of the things that um, I want to, maybe IFOPA can, but it's one of the things I'm going to look at doing um, in the Canadian Association of Special Needs to develop an app um, for individuals with disability. But I think uh, FOP would be a phenomenal one to have a passport. Positioning. When you are uh, going into the dance, what is the best position to be able to have you guys know what is the most comfortable place and how to position yourselves in the most comfortable, comfortable manner? And there are many different things that we have in pediatric offices for sure. And here you're seeing a, um, the... the, the um, the, that's a bean bag actually that sits around an individual that you can actually suck the air out of that gives you phenomenal support and adjusts to the whatever body structure and whatever body positioning you have it adjusts and keeps you really comfortable there are um, bean bags there are cushions there are um, a whole host of different methodologies that you can use within an office environment to make it as comfortable as possible when you're seated to receive any kind of care. Now, the treatment guidelines um, are, have been updated specifically with respect to oral health, and there are a number of very specific new preventive guidelines that you will see when it comes out in January. Um, but ultimately, I don't want anybody to have to go to the operating room. Ultimately, it's about not getting cavities, so that when we get mad as dentists because the oral hygiene is poor, it's not because we're just being nasty, it's because we really care not to take you to the operating room. We don't want to go to the operating room to do this. And so anything that we can do to improve the daily oral health so that you don't get cavities, that you don't get periodontal disease, that you're breathing through your noses, you're breathing well, is where we are looking at um, putting our emphasis. So ultimately, we, we don't want to use, um, um, we, we, we try not to use local anesthetic. Dr. Crow spoke about in the mouth, you can use certain kinds of freezing. You do not want to use a mandibular block, as she said. Um, there are some dentists. I do have a hard tissue laser, so you don't need to use any local anesthetic whatsoever. God forbid you do have a cavity. Um, but there are some newer techniques, like intraligamental, so you can ask your dentist if they have some of these methodologies in terms of providing care if you have to get any kind of treatment, uh, extraction for orthodontic purposes or cavities, such like that. And then the general anesthetic, um, Dr. Crow went through. It's a very specific, very complex process. So treatment risk management, um, essentially, these are in the guidelines. You're all aware of them, limited pressure. You really do not want, um, you've got to be careful of where the treatment is provided. Um, you're all familiar with the need for preoperative prednisone um, and um, whether we do preventive extractions for orthodontics or not again comes into play the risk management 
uh, risk-benefit ratio of whether we actually do extractions for orthodontics. I'll, maybe I won't deal with orthodontics just yet. Um, caries risk, it's a multifactorial disease. It's not simply just sugar diet, but it's multifactorial. There are many things that we have a look at, and if you think of it as an iceberg, um, what you see above ground is the cavity, but there's a ton of stuff underneath that perhaps you are not familiar with that are variables that look towards the ability for you to get or not get disease. And there's a whole process that we can have a look at in terms of how we look at preventing that disease using the um, this is a um, process that was designed by a guy in California where you have a look at those factors that cause disease, those factors that protect it, and you try and marry the two so that you are minimizing the impact of disease over long term. Now, um, Michelle will have these slides. I'm going through them quite quickly, so um, I would need probably a day to go through this in detail with you. You're not dentists, so I'm not going to do that, but it's something I think that you need to be familiar with so that when you do go to your dentist, you can ask them, what are some of the protective factors that you're going to be using for my kid? So many of us talk about diet uh, and um, acid, but I want to focus a little bit on saliva. Saliva is an essential part as one of the variables of disease. And what are some of the strategies that we can use to eliminate these uh, factors? Um, Corey spoke about sulfidiamine fluoride. It's actually perhaps one of the uh, most, the newest process, if you will, that we can actually look at preventing the continuation of cavities with the least impact on an individual. And we can look at doing this from a very early stage of the de decay development. So uh, Corey went through this. I'm not going to go through it in detail. Um, so what are some of the other strategies that we can have a look at? Uh, you'll see there fluoride and Right off the bat, I'm going to recommend that anybody with FOP should be on a high-dose fluoride toothpaste. Bottom line, there are two on the market in North America. Some of times they are not available in South America and Africa, but there are two, and I have no disclosure, I have no no shares in the companies, um, but I think that you want to, fluoride has been shown to be the most impactful of any medicament that we have to limit the amount of decay development. And so if we on a high dose fluoride toothpaste, then you are actually providing daily care. So it's the daily amount of fluoride that you're getting that is going to minimize the onset and the continuation of caries, the disease process. And so I think anybody with FOP should have it, other than kids who are unable to spit. So a child under the age of three who's not able to spit, we do not put them onto this unless they are very high risk. And you can ask your dentist what constitutes high risk or not. Bottom line, if you've got cavities under three years of age, I probably would put you onto a high-dose fluoride toothpaste, even if you're going to swallow some of it. So um, there are a number of strategies based on these different things that we can have a look at and how they impact it. Um, not going to go through the detail with you, and if you have questions related to it, I'd be delighted to ask, answer them. Now, one of the side effects of the many drugs that uh, you on, and the, the interesting thing is 90% of drugs that we take uh, in uh, society actually cause dry mouth. So uh, if you're on a trial and you're getting dry mouth, you want to, they, I know they've given you uh, biotin products. There are other products available like the MI paste or tooth mousse that actually binds to salivary protein. And what that actually does is it keeps the mouth moist, but it does something else. 
it actually decreases the it improves the buffering capacity of saliva every single time every single time you eat sugar or carbohydrate what happens is your bacteria convert that to acid your saliva normally will buffer that back up to normal so if our normal saliva buff, um, ph is say 7.2 you eat sugar the pH goes down to 4. At the pH of 4, as Corey was saying, that acid causes dissolution of calcium from the tooth into the mouth, and you're going to be, get a cavity. So it's not a one step. It's a dynamic process. Generally speaking, with the normal population, within 15 minutes, that buffering capacity comes back up to normal. Now, if you have a drug that's causing dry mouth, or if you have a buffering capacity that's not normal, it might take a half an hour, it may take two hours, it may take three hours for your buffering to come back up. So now you have acid in the mouth for a much longer period of time. This stuff changes the buffering capacity, it changes the pH of the saliva, and it acts like a, um, like a, like a saliva where it uh, keeps the mouth moist. So if you've got dry mouth, um, I highly recommend this. It's been used a lot in radiation therapy in Australia. So that's on top of toothpaste. It does not have fluoride in it. So you can get it without fluoride. It's not toxic. You can use as much of you want as, as, as often as you want. So biofilm, what is biofilm? You imagine a, 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 a river that is not flowing. And the banks of that river that's not flowing gets all that green gunk, right? That's biofilm. Now, if you've got that river flowing really fast, you've got less of it. So every day, every single day, our mouths are creating biofilm. Why do we brush and floss? The brushing and floss flossing agitates that biofilm so that it cannot be active and produce acid. And so that's why we brush and floss every day, guys. So there's a reason why we teach you to brush and floss twice a day, because this biofilm is automatically being created every 24 hours. So that's why we... It, it sounds, you know, soft, sometimes as dentists we don't explain some of this stuff to you guys. Um, but I think if you understand it, you have a better understanding of where to go. So we want to uh, disrupt the biofilm. Um, I've often been asked toothbrushes, electric toothbrushes versus manual toothbrushes. Toothbrushes work great if they're used properly. Toothbrushes work great if they're used properly. Using an electric toothbrush can be way more difficult than using a normal toothbrush. So if you are given an electric toothbrush by your dentist, please ask them to show you how to use it correctly. I can't tell you how many times I've, I hear, oh, we're using an electric toothbrush, and show me how you use it. Completely wrong, and it's not going to work. Um, I love Colgate because they made these $10 jobbies that um, don't work, worth work at all, and it's created all sorts of work for us as dentists. Please don't quote me. Um, we need to evaluate when we're deciding on what it is, what's the dexterity, where, what are the physical limitations, how can we best improve some of those limitations, and Corey's, um, uh, not Corey, um, yeah. Amanda is going to talk about how to adjust a lot of those things um, in, in a few minutes. Um, mouth rinses. The, uh, mouth rinses can be used uh, based on what it is we're trying to adjust, and there are different kinds of mouth rinses that are phenomenal with respect to the impact on bacteria. This just gives you a very quick idea of the many different variables related to uh, the disease process in the mouth. And so they, they multiple. I've been through a little bit of saliva. Um, so I'm not going to go through the detail of the saliva because I want to get to some of the other issues for you. New guidelines, uh, preventive care for individuals with FOP, I've divided up into those patients under the age three, 
Those patients of between age three and adolescence, adolescence and adults. And I've given more specifics with respect to what you need to be have a looking at. So look out for these new preventive guidelines. Don't hesitate, take them with you to your uh, family dentist. And if they have any questions, have them call me or Dr. Crow with respect to answering some of those questions. So look for them when the new guidelines come out and there are some specifics with lists of different things that you can be looking at based on risk based on those five domains that I spoke about as how to minimize disease in the most dramatic process. I've already spoken about MI paste. Orthodontics. Is orthodontics possible in the FOP population? Absolutely. Is it going to wake the sleeping bear? Preferentially, you want orthodontics that are going to have the minimum amount of pressure and the slowest amount of movement. And I am today recommending the use of Invisalign for orthodontics. I am far less um, aggressive than some of my uh, colleagues with respect to FOP and orthodontics. I don't think we should be putting on a lot of um, orthodontic um, wires onto individuals. Um, does it, has it been shown through the literature to actually cause a problem. I don't think there's any literature that we can call on for that. But if we are gonna go with it, Invisalign I think is one of the better ways to go. And again, based on those five domains, let's have a look at evaluating every person individually. So it's not about should we do it or shouldn't we do it. It's about what are the needs of that particular person. Wisdom teeth extractions, very, very similar. Again, my own philosophy, if it's not causing damage, if it's not waking that bear, don't do it. If it is creating a problem, if you've got abscesses, if you've got chronic inflammation, then we need to start to think about it because any time we do wisdom teeth extraction, it's going to be a general anesthetic. The wisdom teeth extraction in of itself is not hard. It's a relatively easy process. What is hard is the general anesthetic, is the recovery from the general anesthetic, is lung function. And so, um, yes, it's done, and it's been done successfully many times, but if we can help not do it, that is generally speaking my goal. So if I am recommending that wisdom teeth and other teeth be removed, it's not likely, guarantee you. Again, general anesthetic is probably the most beneficial. And Amanda, I think that I'm on time um, and allows you to give you, I think we, I answered the questions that folk had, other than perhaps the primary teeth. For me, um, if it's not causing damage again, I'm not gonna worry about it. If that primary tooth is impacting the ability of the child, and oftentimes they're terrified of brushing if they've got a loose tooth and it's creating all sorts of gum disease and bleeding, then I might say, let's take it out under local loc with local anesthesia. Um, but if you've got like shark rows teeth on the bottom, I would just leave them, wait for the baby to fall out on their own if it's not causing any, any damage. So, um, Can I just say a bit, because my son, he, uh, when he was around 13, he had some teeth that, the, the new one came out and the baby teeth was still there. And the dentist, they wanted to take them out. And I asked them, okay, do you have to do it? Are you 100% sure that you have to do it? Because, uh, we, uh, and then they, we had a lot of discussions. And eventually, another person was there looking at him, and they said, eventually, they will fall out, and maybe it will take years. And I can tell you, Hugo, Hugo he, he's 20 years now, and he still have a small piece left, but we've never done anything. So just make sure to keep the teeth really clean. So If it's not causing harm? Yeah. Why? Sometimes there are certain circumstances where the baby teeth are what we call ankylosed, where it prevents the permanent tooth coming in. If you don't take that baby tooth out, you can cause damage. So it's again, look at those five domains, look at what it is, and see in each individual what's going to be in the best interest of that person. So.
I have two questions, if I can. So we mail in teeth for research. Do you receive any feedback that the research has been useful and how it has helped? And uh, my second question is, does FOP affect the dental structure of the FOP patients more or not as much as non-FOP patients? That's a great question. And my answer to your first question is, from my understanding, um, the, um, there are the, the teeth that are mailed in. I know that I spoke with a doctor from Amsterdam, and um, he's re-asking me for any teeth that come through. So um, from a perspective of the research, I don't know the specifics of it, but I think it's incredibly helpful for them. Teeth have stem cells in them. Um, and um, it's one of the few things that we do know that you can get the stem cells from the teeth. And so it's extremely useful. Um, with respect to your um, second question, sorry, it just hit, it just left my head. What was it? Oh, thank you. Does FOP affect the, the dental structure? FOP in of itself, I don't believe, affects the dental structure. However, what does affect the dental structure is the manner in which you swallow, the manner in which you eat, the diet that we eat. And so all of those things do affect the dental structure. So there's current literature today, believe it or not, that says that um, orthodontics and where we're going is not actually a genetic issue. It's based upon what we eat. And if you have a closed or unclosed jaw from a very early age and you're only eating a soft diet, that's going to impact your dental structure. So it's not FOP per se that's doing it, but it could be a combination of many of those issues. If we are not swallowing properly and the back of our tongue doesn't go up to the top of our palate, our palate does not get expanded and so your palate's going to collapse. Is that FOP or is that um, the manner in which we're swallowing? So I think that it's very hard to answer that specifically. There's one concern that I would like to find answers. Um, well, how do you handle um, the ch risk of choking or to prevent aspiration? Stuff like That's that. a great question. So how do we handle risk of choking? So the, the first thing that I need to know is what are the triggers for the choking? Is the individual... Do, are they gaggers? If you touch them, do they gag? Uh, what, what are the triggers for the choking? And there are many different ways that we can deal with that. So positioning, holding the jaw in a particular way, brushing in a particular way. And let me give you an example. If your teeth are completely closed and you brush your teeth with mouth closed, you're never going to gag. Open your mouth and brush and stimulate the back palate, you're gonna gag. So if you've got a kid who's a gagger, um, and if you're brushing and they gag, that's very simple. Tell them to keep their teeth together, completely closed. Don't use toothpaste, use just straight water initially. Brush all in the outside and you will not gag. You cannot gag if your teeth are completely closed. Then you can go to the next piece and start to brush and slowly desensitize the gagging process. And there are ways that you can do that using what we call sensory integration. So this, this talk is not, I, I don't have the time to go through exactly what it is, but I can go through some of the uh, methodologies for you um, separately, if you like. OK. Okay. You know what? Think... We are around today. I'm in clinic tomorrow. I'm around this whole afternoon. Both myself and Dr. Uh, Dr. Crow are quite willing to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you so much. I think I can't remember if it's if it's in both the names of your practices, but you you've often said dentistry for special people, and I just think you're both special dentists too to be so committed to um, working and making sure that our families get the best treatment possible and that we're able to really focus on prevent preventative. Uh, measures with them. So thank you so much for being with us here today. Help me thank them.